Easter, everybody. Happy Resurrection Weekend. Come on, let's all stand up. Let's celebrate Jesus.
Hallelujah. How many of you are glad you're in the house of God today? Happy Resurrection Sunday. This is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus made this statement. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, that's a powerful statement when the Son of God makes that declaration. I am the resurrection and the life. You realize this, guys. Without the resurrection, there would be no purpose for why we're even here. Well, there'd be no reason for church. There'd be no reason to even show up on a Sunday if there had not been the resurrection. So today, I want to welcome you to Lighthouse Church. You might be visiting with us for the very first time, or maybe it's been a long time since you've been with us. We've got two ways we would love to get to know you better. For those of you that are technology uh, proficient, not challenged, uh, if you want to, in front of you, there's on the seat back in front of you, if you'll take your smartphone, just scan the little QR code, and the very first button on there is a welcome card. You can do that electronically. Or if you'd like to, you can do it old school. In the seat front in front of, in front of you, there is a little welcome card, and it says, we're so glad you're here. If you got in and got a gift bag, that card is also in there for you. I want to welcome all of my guests and visitors. Church, let's just welcome everybody that might be here today. On this little crazy QR code, you can find out more about Lighthouse. Or go to our website. You can learn about connect groups and small groups. You can even, if you want to get baptized, there's a button I think there for you. I want to mention one thing, that in the lobby, after service, ladies, I want to mention there is a sign-up for you. We've got a big women's event coming up this coming 30th, April the 30th, from 11 to 1. You can sign up in the lobby, or if you're technically proficient, you can go ahead and do that right there online. I am so excited that you're here to join us in worship. Pastor Dexter is going to lead us in a few more songs. We're going to flow in and out of music and preaching. Uh, we are excited that you're here. Look around, guys. The church is full. This is what God desires. I'm so glad that you're here. Let's do this now. Let's just take a moment. Let's begin to soak in all that the Spirit of God would want us to receive and let's experience the essence of Easter.
Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's why the resurrection is just more than, more than a historical fact. The resurrection is Jesus Christ himself. There's hope of resurrection for your marriage. He's doing something new. There's hope of resurrection for your finances. There's hope of resurrection for your health. I don't know what you're walking through today, but I'm telling you today right now, when the resurrection and the life walks into the room and steps into your life, anything can happen. Do you believe that this morning? If you believe that, raise your hands right now. Lift your hands, lift your hearts. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that when Jesus steps into our lives, all things are possible. We thank you for your blood. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your love for us.
to his name. How many of you are grateful that Jesus died for you and for his blood? Come on, let's give him praise. He deserves all our praises. He deserves all our love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. Amen. That was the last time we get to watch that video, and that's the last time I'm going to have tears rolling down my cheeks as I walk up on the platform. I don't know about you, but a crazy little video like that can affect your life. We're so glad that you're here with us today, and I'm so happy that uh, the house is full on this Lord's Day, and uh, thank you so much. I want to, congregation, let's just welcome all of our guests and visitors one more time. Um, I wanted to just kind of set the tone for us just as we get started, and, and I want to welcome and speak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. Man, I'm telling you, you guys look beautiful today. Everybody's, how many went out and got something new for today? I got a new shirt and a new, I got a new, got a haircut, and I got a new, got a new pocket square, you know? So, you know, Easter, you got to do those kinds of things. If you got in today and you would like to participate, I realize that we maybe have guests and visitors that maybe it's, you're uncomfortable, maybe the way that you've been taught or raised. I understand that, and I want to fully respect that. But there will be a portion of our service that we will be partaking of communion. And if you got past, I know we got really busy back there in the back, and there's a little table there. There should be a basket. If I could have one of my gentlemen, if you, if you would like to get, I call them a K-cup. I don't know. You know, it's kind of like we don't, pass the, we don't pass the plate anymore because everybody's concerned about COVID. So we use these kind of crazy things, and they seem to be fairly easy to work with. So if you did not get a communion cup and you would like one, just raise your hand real quickly. Again, this is not a requirement. Nobody is, 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 is mandatorily made, but if you would like one, we we want to make sure we get that in your hand. Fantastic. Thank you, greeters and ushers, for making that happen for me today. I want to thank Pastor Dexter and our worship team. Um, they did an amazing job setting the tone, and, and I'm not sure if you grasped the, the magnitude of the songs that were sung, but they really told the story of this weekend very, very well. And, and so we're going to be unpacking Easter in a little bit different tone today. It's, it's still the Easter message. It's still the resurrection message. And, and, but, it, but I have a little bit of a, a twist that I want to bring to your mind this morning as we unpack the message. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Luke. And if you have electronic devices that you use, that's great. If you have a Bible, that's fantastic. But guess what? If you have neither, we'll have it on the screen there for you. So it'll make it very simple for you. I want to thank Pastor Dexter and his worship team. And for those of you that didn't recognize Suzanne Peebles, she was a guest of ours today. And I want to thank her so much for being with us this morning. I've known Suzanne for years, and, and Suzanne did an, uh, did an amazing job helping us. She'll be back in a few moments, and uh, we'll have some more singing and closing out the service and partaking of communion. 
Over the last several weeks, Pastor Barry and I have been teaching from a series called Essence. And about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, I was praying about this month. And I was just saying, okay, Lord, what would you have us to speak to the people during the month of April, during Easter's month? And, and, and all I heard in my spirit was the word essence. And I started thinking and rolling it in my mind, the essence of Easter. And I, and I, and I began to think about it. I began to process this word essence. And I don't know about you, but I think it's important maybe that we look up words that we don't know. <laughs> you know, how many, how, when was the last time any one of you used the word essence in a sentence? I mean, it's just not one of those words we use with regularity. And that word essence, so, so most of us, if you've got an electronic device or a computer, what do you do? You Google it. And I, and I firmly believe that between Google and God, you can do just about anything. But Google, the definition is, it comes up, and when that definition pops up, if you don't like that definition, what do you do? You go to the next definition, right? So I started going through the definitions, and as I was going through the definitions, I found this definition for essence. It says, essence is very simply the basic, the real, the invariable nature of something or someone. And, and when I was reading that, I was thinking, okay, there's something more to that that I'm not grasping, so then what's the next step? If the dictionary doesn't clarify it for you, what do you do? You go to the thesaurus, right? For those of us that, that, that do that, I'm a geek that way. I try to find the same word in 17 different ways, so that way I don't say it 17 times the same way, you know? But a thesaurus was telling me the, that the, the essence of something is the ethos of it. It's the core of it. It's the, it's the meaning and the purpose, the nature Maybe the spirit or the soul of something. It's the structure of something. So, I mean, it's, it's when you get to the core of something, when you get to the ethos of something, that's the essence of what we're talking about. In our passage of Scripture, we're going to open, and I'm going to have a little bit longer read than I typically do because I want to give you the entirety of it, and I will go back and I will walk you through it as we talk it through. But it's a story of the narrow door. It's not typically an Easter message. It's not typically a passage that ministers will go to as they try to unpack this story of Easter, of the Resurrection Sunday, of the cross, uh, uh, of the grave, of the tomb, uh, of the beatings, the whippings, the scourgings, and all of the things that we typically get to hear about on Easter Sunday. Instead, I was reading through the book of Luke, and I came across this passage, and if you want to watch it and read it over my shoulder, I'll actually read it from the screen for myself as well. It says, Jesus went through the towns and the villages teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He replied, work hard to enter into the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but will fail. It says, when the, the master of the house was locked, has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for you will see Abram, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you will be thrown out. And people will come from all over the world, from the east and the west, the north and the south, to take their places in the kingdom of God. And note this, some will seem least important now will be greatest then, and some who are greatest now will be least important then. At that time, some Pharisees said to him, get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus replied, go tell that fox. I will, be, I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and the third day I will accomplish my purpose. Yes, today and tomorrow and the next day I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't do for the prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often... I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And our final verse says this, and now look, your house is abandoned and you will never see me again until you say blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we ask over the next few moments that you would cause my tongue, as the Bible says, to be that of a ready writer, that I might be able to communicate, Heavenly Father, not what I've prepared, but ultimately what Holy Spirit desires to say to the people today. Father, there are people in this house, first-time visitors, long-time members, and somewhere in between, each one of us nears to hear what God is saying through this message. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that you wouldn't single out anyone independently, but Lord, that each one would be impacted tremendously. Father, myself included. I ask, Heavenly Father, as we really grasp the essence of Easter, you would do it through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Questions. Questions are a powerful thing, aren't they? You know, it's amazing when I, when I talk about questions, questions, they, they, can, they can reveal so much value. Questions can be good and questions can be bad. Questions could be the right, that's a right question. Oh, that's a wrong question. We can find that questions will seek information. They'll imply information or they might even qualify information. What did you mean by that? Smart questions make people smarter. And how many of you have ever heard this, this term? The only dumb question is what? Is the one that you never ask. The reality of questions is, is we learn how to connect through them. We learn how to learn through them. We learn through observation and we invent through questions. We push boundaries and discover secrets. We solve mysteries and we imagine new ways of doing things. We ponder our purpose and we set our sights through questions. Questions asked the right way, under the right circumstances, move us forward and they propel us forward to achieve, to accomplish, to open doors and to provide success. Insightful questions help us connect with a stranger, maybe get a job in an interview, maybe even possibly entertain at a dinner table. Do you realize that not only are there insightful questions, valuable questions, right questions, wrong questions, but we can also have reflective questions. How many of you have ever asked yourself a question? When you ask yourself a question, what happens is you go down deep into the inner parts of your being, and, you, and, it, and it, it affects you. But sadly, what I've learned is oftentimes people don't like to ask questions, because when they ask a question, if it's a response that they don't like, guess what happens? We reject, the, we reject the answer. But most of the time, what we like to do is we like to make statements declaring what we know rather than asking questions revealing what we're inquiring about. And so what happens is we can have the, the, this question, and the question also, it reveals the intent of a heart. It reveals so much of us. It can be equally self-empowering or self-destructive. Well, let me give you some examples of what I mean by this. What could I accomplish if I really believed? What could I accomplish if I really believed? You know what? That answers potential. What about this? What's the use anyway? How many of you have ever asked that question? What's the use anyway? You know what that determines? It determines our hope. How about, what's God's intent, intent for my life? That seeks direction. God, where am I going? What am I going to do? How about this? Why has all of this happened to me? That laments trouble. Every question has power. And you might be saying to yourself, Pastor Bob, what do you mean? Why? What does this have to do with Easter? I'm glad you asked. Thank you for, three of you might have asked that question, but the reality is this is an Easter message. What in the world does questions have to do with Easter? I'm glad you asked, but you know what? Don't you hate it when people respond to your question with a, another question? So my, my response to you is this, and because I'm going to do it. Pastor Bob, what does this have to do with Easter? I'm going to ask a question of you. What is the real essence of Easter? When you stop and think about Everything that happened this weekend, historically, what is the essence of Easter? What is the, the foundation of Easter? What is the, the core, the ethos, the purpose, the spirit behind, and the meaning of Easter? 
like I shared with you over the past two weeks, Pastor Barry and have, have done our best to, to unpack our very first week. We talked about the essence of purpose. The second week was Pastor Barry's message, and he met, met, shared with you the essence of love. Did a marvelous job. You can watch those online. But as I was thinking through these processes of these questions, I was spurred because of this message about the subject of questions. Did you know that your Bible has over 3,200 questions written in it? 3,294 to be exact, according to the King James Bible. And, and, and again, we're not teaching from the King James today. We're teaching from the New Living. But I have a study Bible that the authors and the writers of this book actually scribed or wrote out every question in the Bible. Your Old Testament has 2,272 questions in the Old Testament. And, and I'll be honest with you. Some in here are looking at me like, Pastor Bob, I really don't care. Honestly, the only reason I'm giving you those numbers is for the geeks in the room. Do I have any geeks in the room that really care about stuff like that? I mean, seriously, that's the stuff that in me I'm going, wow, that's pretty cool. 2,272 questions in the Old Testament, 1,022 questions in the New Testament. And guess what? I read all of the New Testament questions. I went through over the course of a couple of days, and I read all 1,022 questions. And where I needed clarity, because I couldn't understand it in the context, I went to the passage. So I read all 1,022 questions. Now, guys, I'm telling you, there's some powerful things in the Bible. It's amazing what those questions revealed. Some of them were snarky. You know, you know what I mean by the word snarky? It was kind of, a, it was kind of a, 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 a response to somebody that would just say, hey, what do you think? You know, and it was kind of like throwing it on them. And some of the questions revealed information. Some of the questions revealed direction and purpose. And some of the questions were, were pretty amazing. But in the midst of these questions, there was one question that seemed to be sadly and sorely missing in its redundancy, in its repetitiveness. And it begins in our message. There was a gentleman in Luke chapter 13, verse number 22 and 23, that we find the beginning of our message with a question. I think it's the most important question in your Bible. It's probably one of the ones that most of us don't even pay attention to or have fairly consistently li limited ourselves in asking. Because there was this certain someone that asked a question in our opening passage that I believe is critically important. So when we talk about this question, it was a request. How many of you know that Jesus got asked questions quite a bit? But in this request or this question, this petition, this inquiry, this, 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 this desire to know more, we have a gentleman in Luke chapter 13, verse 22 and 23. It says, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. Now, mind you, let me, let me pause right there at that point where it says he was on his way to Jerusalem. Last week and two weeks ago, Pastor Barry and I unpacked for you, and how many of you are aware, or maybe you've not been that familiar, but this last week in the church world, it's considered Passion Week. All of the amazing things, all of the amazing circumstances from the triumphant entry into Jerusalem through his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, that happens over the course of this week. We just happen to be culminating today in the Resurrection Sunday. But Jesus makes this statement. He was on his way to Jerusalem, just going through the towns and the villages, teaching as he went. And the Bible says that someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? Less than 10 times in your New Testament out of those 1,022 questions is a question similar to this asked. And it weighed on me all of a sudden. It weighed on me with some great significance. And, and, and I thought to myself, how important of a question was that? This guy, it's amazing to me. And I love the fact that sometimes the Bible writes just someone or a woman said or he said. or They don't give an indication of the person's name. I love that because any one of us could have asked that question. And you know, when you ask a question like that, there's no insignificant people in your Bible. 
Just like I don't believe that there's any insignificant people in the body of Christ. I think every one of us have a destiny and a purpose that God wants every one of us to truly fulfill. Can I get an amen for that one? So someone, this could have been you, it could have been me, traveling with Jesus. Hey, Jesus, got this question. Will only a few be saved? And, and oftentimes I hear it, you know, I've heard it in my whole life. I'm, I'm one of those kids that, you know, and, and, and I know maybe, maybe there's a relating difference between us, but, but I'm the kid that was pretty much raised in church. I was born, and then not shortly after that, I was born again, and then not shortly after that, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and got baptized and did all those things. I never drank, never smoked, never hung out with people that did, didn't do drugs. You know, just the weird, you know, but you know what? Still bad stuff happened to me. Lost my dad, got sexually abused as a 10-year-old boy. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Terrible can still happen to people that don't live those lives. But someone asked, this unnamed someone asked this question, and I found it in the Bible, and I'm only going to read a few of these because I think that the request was significant. Acts chapter 16, verse number 30 said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 2, verse 37, brothers, what should we do? And this was in context after the preaching of the gospel. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Paul makes a declaration in Acts chapter 22, verse 10. He says, I asked, what should I do, Lord? And in Luke chapter 10, one of the religious leaders said this to Jesus, said, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a powerful question. It's actually a life-changing question if you stop and think about it. Preceding Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem, before he walked in, and in Luke chapter 19, I read it to you two weeks ago, as he looked over Jerusalem, they're cheering. <laughs> you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Bible says that he wept over this city. And we saw this pain that he was in. And oftentimes what happens is, is we, before he enters this city and before his betrayal, before the trial, before the beatings and the scourgings, prior to the abandonment of his own disciples, and, but, 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 but prior to the crucifixion, prior to the burial of Jesus, prior to all of this happening, we find out there's a question. Will there only be a few saved? Now, let me give you good news. I love in the, how the Bible reveals itself. Does that make sense? Everybody okay? Now, as a pastor, I know. I, I know I, I, let, me, let, me, let me say this to you. There is good news. Revelation chapter 7, verse number 9 says this. I saw a vast crowd too great to count. That, to me, is good news. That means that, the he that heaven's probably going to be a whole lot more full than some of you religious folks think it will be. <laughs> Okay, it's gonna, it, there, there's going to be a bunch of people there, and I'm excited. I'm very excited because if, if John, in the, the, John the Revelator makes the statement, there was too many people, I couldn't count them, he must have been looking over a pretty big crowd. Now let's just be honest, though, with ourselves. Is everybody going to be there? Nope. And that's the sad fact that we all in the church have to get some sort of a burden for because there is a lot of people, probably more than we can count, that are not going to be there either. And so when I look at the following verses over the next few moments of today's message, Jesus begins to answer someone's request. He provides clarity and consequence. He reveals prophecy to what was to come. Let me say this to you. Questions... Questions are powerful, but there is something far more powerful. We've been spending the first 15, 20 minutes of this message talking about the question, but isn't it the answer probably the more important part of the entire message? That's the most important aspect. Easter to so many people is so many things. It's the new shirt. It's the fresh haircut. It's the dress. It's whatever. It might even be the lunch that is right now, you're doing this. You got me until 5 after 12, and if not, I'm bolting. 
But it's our Sunday best. It's the Easter egg hunts for our kids. It's so much more than that, guys. Because the very first thought I had for you about the essence of Easter is this. The essence of Easter, its meaning, its purpose, its substance, is found in the answer, Jesus. Say Jesus. I love how Pastor Dexter did that during worship. Just say the name. Say it again. The answer to this essence of Easter is Jesus. But I'm going to take you on a journey, a very, very short one this morning, but I'm going to take you on a journey because out of this request comes a response. If you ask a question, how many of you want an answer? There's a response that is given. Every question that seeks a response Some we like and some we don't. I'm setting the stage for you. Luke chapter 13, verse 24. And he replied, work hard to enter into the narrow door of God's kingdom for many will try to enter but will fail. Now that work hard is probably a poor translation. In fact, I think it's a poor translation because I think the word is better used as strive, better used as zealously pursue. See, I think oftentimes what happens is, 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 is we attend church, we, 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 we work in the parking lot, we, we pass a bucket, we sing a song, we work with our children, and something in us says, well, I'm with Jesus, I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing, but there's something that is absently missing from their soul, and that's the relationship with Jesus Christ. And he says here, there is something, it's, it's not a just one and done ticket stamp punched, I'm on my way. There's a process, not of salvation, but working out our salvation, so to speak. We're supposed to strive to something, and I find it interesting. As I read that response, he didn't just answer, Jesus just didn't answer the guy's question. It's a very simple answer, if you think about it. How many people are going to be in heaven? Will there only be a few? That's a yes or a no, right? Will there only be a few? Yes. Will, that, will there only be a few? No. That's a very simple answer, yes or no. But the reality is he shifts the question. And he starts to go over the next several verses to the explanation and the response that he wants to give. Interesting how he moves it from who's going to be saved to are you pursuing salvation? He goes from this place of how many are going to get saved to, hey, are you pursuing? You have to work hard. You have to strive. You have to pursue zealously. But I think oftentimes we like the simple answer. How many of you like the easy button? You know what I'm talking about? The little red button. You hit it, you know, the easy button. I think that was a commercial several years ago. We all love the easy button. But Jesus doesn't reply in an easy way. As a matter of fact, he doesn't supply an answer that makes the ears feel good. The Bible says in the last days there will be ministers of the gospel that will preach messages that make your ears feel good. But really that's not the gospel that we want to minister. He's deeply honest and the weight of the question of this someone and his response have dire results that weigh in the balance of eternity. So it's one thing to give a simple answer to someone. It's one thing to say, well, yes or no. Is there going to be a few? Yes or no. But he goes on and he begins to continue to explain. Because oftentimes the initial response is not the only response. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So this initial response, he says, hey, we've got to strive. We've got to pursue zealously this this salvation. And then he begins to explain the results if we don't. And the results are quite clear, and they're quite impending. It says here, when the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. There's going to come a day, guys, when we can no longer ask for salvation. There's going to come a day when we can no longer receive the Spirit of Christ. He says, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. When you... Then you will say, but we ate and we drank with you. We, we went to church with you. We, we served in the parking lot together. We, 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 we worked as a greeter. We worked as an usher. We, do you, I went to church. But he says, get away from me. 
all you who do evil because I don't know you or where you come from. He says there in verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom, but you will be thrown out. There, the, the result of this question and the response says, if, if there's not a zealous pursuit, he said there's a consequence. There's a consequence for an absence of zealous pursuing. And, and then he goes on to say, though, I love the fact that Jesus doesn't just give them the bad answer. How many of you glad for that? He gives them a good answer, too. He says, but there's going to be people from all over the place. They're going to come from the east and the west and the north and the south to take their places in the kingdom of God. There are going to be those that have zealously pursued. There are going to be those that have strived for this thing called salvation. And it goes on to say in the next verse, it says, and, and note, some will seem least important now. So, so you might be the diaper changer now, but down the road, the reward is pretty awesome. But you might be the preacher now, and guess what? Your reward may be less. Don't get confused that because I'm preaching the message, I get the highest reward. I still think of Mrs. Nowak, my seven-year-old Sunday school teacher, where she introduced me to Jesus. And I wonder how many children Mrs. Nowak led to the Lord. What is her reward going to look like? We give some kind of reverence and honor to this pulpit, and I'm grateful that you do. But the truth of the matter is, I just happen to be called to this. You might be a plumber. The difference is, is, am I zealously pursuing as much as you're zealously pursuing your walk with God? Because he goes on to say, he says, there's, there's, there's benefits and there's rewards, but there's also consequences to what's going on. Questions demand a response, but how willing are we to accept the results of our inquiry? There's an Old Testament passage in our Bibles, and, there's a, and, and I can't remember where it is right off the top of my head. And, and God actually lays before the people. He says, guys, I would lay before you life and death. And it's my desire for you that you would choose life. I love how God gives the answer with the question. He's doing the same thing here. He's giving the answer with the question. And he's not only just responding with a yes or a no, but he's giving clarity to the foundation of that question. There's coming a time when the answer to our inquiry cannot change and the door of opportunity will pass. People will think that they have all the answers, but they will be of asking the wrong questions. And the results of the question have been tallied. Jesus is saying, here's the tally marks. There will be some that will left knocking. There'll be some that will be left in the street. There'll be some that will be in the experience, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. There will be some that will have a great expulsion of opportunity. Yet, this is the joy of my heart, there is the opportunity for a great many to enter into the kingdom. And there will be an outpouring of reward for those that do. God has always got a response to all of life questions. Pastor Dexter did a wonderful job during exhortation and I'm so proud of him in the way that he articulated it because it matched the message so well in the, in the fact that he says, I don't know if you're here, but the resurrection power of God can resurrect a marriage. He can, he can resurrect a relationship. He can resurrect your body with the physical ailments that you might be dealing with. He can resurrect your finances. He can resurrect a spiritual walk with him if it seems lost and dead and boring. It doesn't have to be lost and dead and boring. It can be exciting. Because all of life's questions have answers. God has an answer for every one of them. Depending on our response to the choices that are offered... Is the will determine the consequences and the results. You know, it's interesting. I don't know about you, but have you ever given an answer to someone and they got mad at you for the answer you gave? They might, you might, you might present an answer or you might present a response. You might offer the results of the choice. It could be on your job. It could be in your marriage, it could be at work, it could be in your family. Some of you might be getting together with family today for that, that, that Easter ham or whatever. Right? You know what I'm talking about. But have you ever asked a question and they responded to you something like this? How dare you? 
They just they asked you a question. You gave them an answer, and they looked at, how dare you? I would never. What makes you think? You know, and you hear there's a reprimand in there. The tone and the, and, and the tenor of that voice communicates a reprimand. I'm greater than you are. How dare you ask me such a question? Jesus doesn't respond that way, but the people do. They give a response. They get this response. Okay, choose heaven or hell. Choose life or death. Here's an opportunity that you're going to experience being left out or you can be welcomed in. And hey, guess what, guys? This is the answer for everyone. Because when we talk about a reprimand, one of the things that we want to think about is that society continually fights against the essence of Easter. It continually fights against this relationship and walk with God. Luke chapter 13 and 31 tells us this, that at, that, at some time Pharisee, the, the Pharisees said to him, get away, get, get away from here. If you want to live, Herod Antipas wants to kill you. He's, so, so the response comes, the results of the response are clear, and all of a sudden, there was a group of people that said, how dare you? Get out of here. Get out of here. We didn't ask for that answer. That's not the answer I wanted. That's not what I wanted to hear. And what they did is they not only said, get out of here, they threatened his life. Anybody ever have your life threatened because of a question you've ever asked? <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's a pretty serious question. And guys, you have to remember, this is far beyond or far before there was ever the experience of the cross at Calvary. In life, there's always going to be people, guys. There's always going to be individuals that are not really interested in your opinion or in the decisions that you've made in life. Parents are going to have an opinion. Teachers are going to have an opinion. Pastors are going to have an opinion. I get that. Even parishioners all have opinions about the questions you might be asking. Nobody likes to be reprimanded. Not a single one of us. Nobody likes to be told that's foolish thinking. Why would you ask such a question? Your thoughts are crazy. But a reprimand can come from a question. It can come from a response given, and it can come as a reaction to results shared. Guys, I want you to understand something, that pressure comes to us all. But asking the right questions, the powerful, life-changing ones, some folks won't be excited about the answer that's presented. They don't enjoy the answer. They don't enjoy the response. They don't enjoy the results. And as a result, they'll reprimand you. Jesus Recognize the reprimand of the Pharisees at this moment. And in closing, I've got a, two more bullet points that I want to share with you. You know, it's interesting. How do you respond? Let me ask you this question. How do you respond to reprimand? How do you respond to being reprimanded? You know, it was interesting to me that Jesus just didn't go, whoa, whoa. That was a good question. <laughs> I got to think about that one just a little bit. He didn't pull back after giving the explanation to the response. He didn't, he didn't go, man, you know what? You're right. Let me pull back on that answer just a little bit here. Let me soften it up a little bit so it can be more palatable to more people. You know, in John chapter 6, there was a response that was given by his disciples. His disciples reprimanded him for declaring what he was declaring. And he looked at his own disciples and said, are you going to leave too? So what do I find in Jesus' personality? Is he rebuked? There was a rebuke when people were thinking wrong. When they were thinking incorrectly, when they were maybe responding to the wrong questions. And in, in the final two thoughts that I have, the rebuke is the second to final thought. And in Luke chapter 13, I can prove it to you. Luke chapter 13, verse 32, it says this, Jesus replied, go tell that fox. Who's the fox he's talking about? The verse before we were talking about was Herod. Herod Antipas. He's the one that threatened. He's the one that said he's going to kill you. Just for a little side note, little fun thing for everybody in the room. Jesus called people names. He called, G he called Herod a fox. It wasn't a term of endearment at that moment. I look at my wife and I said, there's a fox. 
That's a term of endearment. This was not a term of endearment when he was talking about Herod. He was, he was calling him out. And he made this statement, go tell that fox, I will keep on casting out demons. Can I get an amen? amen. Jesus said, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. He said, I'm going to keep on casting out demons. And look at what he said. I'm going to keep on healing people. I love that verse. I love that verse. I love that verse. He says, I'm going to keep on casting out demons. That's the ministry of Jesus. That's the ministry of why he came. You go to the back book of Luke, chap, and, and, it, it, and, and we find that the prophetic was that was his calling to cast out demons and to heal people. And what did he say? I'm going to do it today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Basically what he was saying, he said, you go tell that fox, bring it on, Mr. Devil. I got you. I got your number. I know what you're trying to do. I know what you're trying to prevent. In this passage, we begin to see the unpacking of prophecy. We begin to, be, begin to see he's prophetically declaring and prophetically calling out what his future looks like. He says, I know, I know what I'm fixing to step into, but I'm not stopping in any way. How many of us in the room have ever pulled back because we've gotten resistance? How many of us have ever stopped being what we're supposed to be because of resistance? Jesus said, uh-uh, Mr. Devil, Mr. Fox, I'm going to keep on casting out demons. Mr. Fox, I'm going to keep healing the sick. He's saying that to you today. I don't know what's going on in your heart. I don't know. Maybe there is a healing that needs to manifest right now in Jesus' name. If it's a physical pain, if it's an emotional pain, if it's a spiritual pain, if it's a financial pain, whatever it is, I just pray in Jesus' name right now, you begin to release that healing into their bodies. But he said this, I'm going to do it today and tomorrow. What does that reveal? It reveals to you and me that he's going to keep on doing what he's doing. But here's where it gets prophetic. Here's where it gets prophetic. He says, I'm going to keep on casting out demons, healing people today and tomorrow, and the third day. Now, now wait a minute. I'm not sure if you guys are getting this. I'm not sure if you're seeing what I'm seeing. But do you see what the third day, the significance of that declar declarative statement was? The Bible says that through the cross... There was, a, there was going to come a crucifixion. There was going to come a beating and a scourging and a whipping and a tearing down. There was going to be a moment that even the devil thought he had his day. But through this cross, through the blood that was shed, there was a, there was a grave on the other side. And the grave on the other side held our Savior for not one, not two, but what does it say? three days. And on the third day, there was power in the third day because what we celebrate this morning is resurrection day. He said on that third day, it's going to get even really a lot better right now, because on the third day, what does he say as you read it with me? I will accomplish my purpose. On the third day, Guys, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about things like that. That might, I don't know, that, that stirs me up just a little bit. That Jesus, knowing all that was before him, verse number 33 says this. He says that, yes, today, tomorrow, and the next day I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be due for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. He knew what was coming. He knew what laid before him. He knew that there would be a cross. He knew that there might be some crown. He knew that there would be pain and suffering and anguish and sorrow. He knew that there would be a death that would manifest. But he saw the third day. The Bible says that he looked through the cross and he despised the shame. Why? He saw the third day. Because on the third day, what does it say? It says, I will accomplish. Jesus' purpose wasn't fulfilled here. It wasn't finished here. It wasn't done here. 
We celebrate Easter and the cross with, with great reverence. We, we sing about the cross. We, we, we declare it when we talk about the blood. We talk about it when we talk about communion. But the cross wasn't the final answer. This wasn't the purpose. The purpose was the third day. Because the third day was the resurrection. The third day was the resurrection and the life. And regardless of the reprimand, Jesus pursued his purpose. So the second thing I want you to understand, we understand that the essence of Easter was the answer through Jesus, but we understand that the essence of Easter was clearly understood by Jesus, and it was going to happen on that third day. It was going to happen on that third day. At this point in the sermon, I would like to take a pause because I think it's important for us to reflect on what that cross did. You know, Jesus, even with his disciples, even with his disciples, just days before, the day before he was to be crucified, the Bible says that he observed Passover. Many of you may have treated Passover differently in different churches. There's different ways to do it. I have friends of mine that did Seder dinners, and there's all kinds of ways to celebrate the Passover. But Jesus, in his reflective tone, hanging out with his disciples, really prophetically telling them about what was coming. They didn't know. They're still, I would say, moderately clueless on Thursday. But come Friday, they began to see this prophetic answer become revealed and become reality. And you know what he did is he took a moment and he said, guys, this is what's fixing to happen. I'm fixing to be, I'm fixing to, to, to shed my blood. My body's going to be broken. He says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And so if you have your little cup and you want to partake with us, I want you to do me a favor. Look at me, everybody. These things are, these, they're tricky. All right. Turn it upside down first with, the, with the, the juice on the bottom and the little wafer on the top. And you take the wafer out first. Okay? Now you can turn it the right side up and you won't spill nothing. All right, everybody good? Say, thank you, Pastor Bob. I like my, I like my brand new dress. And you know, grape, grape juice on a, on a pretty dress doesn't mean, it, it's just not good. But go ahead and crack that open for just a moment. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus saw the third day. When he, was, when he was partaking with his disciples, he saw that third day. And before Jesus was found in the garden, before he endured the cross, before he went through the grave, before he came to the resurrection, he partook and he remembered Passover and gave it prophetically to his team, to his disciples, and said, let's do this together. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26 through 28, it says this, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took the cup of wine and gave thanks for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. There's another passage in the book of Corinthians, and it talks a little bit about how we take this communion. And it's important to me that I make sure that we are all right before God, because the Bible talks about taking it in an unworthy manner. If we take it in a wrong manner, we take it without a right spirit, without a right heart, guess what? The Bible says that, that we, 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 we don't necessarily proclaim Christ the right way. What we end up doing is we, we, we speak sickness and illness, and the Bible says even death into ourselves. And so I want every one of us to just partake of this together in the right way. And that means we need to repent and just simply ask God to forgive us. If we don't know Jesus, we need to declare him as such. Otherwise, it's just grape juice and a cup. And just by the way, some of you may come from churches where you use wine. We don't use wine. We just use grape juice, okay? No, don't, don't be offended by that. Partaking doesn't mean you have to be a member of Lighthouse Church. It just means you should be a member of the kingdom of God. So let's pray this together and just say it out loud with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask right now that you'd forgive me of all of my sin. 
I believe Jesus is the Savior of mankind. I believe that he loved me, that he died for me. And Lord, I partake of this bread and this drink as a remembrance of all that Jesus did. Forgive me of my sin, my shortcoming. And I pray as I partake that I'm honoring Christ in the way he intended. In Jesus' name. Pastor Dexter and Suzanne are going to lead us in just a moment. And I'm going to let you take the cups together. You take it at your own timing. You take it when you're ready in your heart. We're going to sing a couple songs and I have my last bullet point and we're going to get out of here. But I want this moment to be a reverential moment. And you partake when you're ready. Okay? Husbands, wives, maybe you want to get together and pray together. That's okay. But, but take, to, take it in, in a reverential manner. Okay? So with that being said, you can partake when you're ready. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You know, as I, as I was considering the conclusion of this message, Jesus knew what it would take to accomplish his purpose. What was started out in our passage in Luke chapter 13 was culminated in John chapter 18 in an illustration in the garden. Jesus has just gotten done praying and he's saying, God, I don't want to do this. I'll do it any other way. Three times he makes the declaration, God, if you could change the way we're doing it, I'd be okay with that. Anybody ever pray that way to God and ask him that question? God, could we do it a different way? And in John chapter 18, there's this passage. It says, Luke, Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the Olive Grove. And this is the verse, probably underlined in my Bible, almost every Bible I have. Jesus fully realized all 
that was going to happen to him. Guys, when we're in Luke chapter 13, Jesus realized all that was going to happen to him. Jesus knew going into Jerusalem on that triumphant Sunday, on the week of the Passion, all that was going to happen to him. He enters the garden and begins to pray. And when Judas shows up with his infantry, Jesus realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them. And I love it. He asked a question. Don't you love it? On the front end, we have a young someone that asked a question. Well, only a few. And here we close our message out. We close our sermon out with another question. Who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And you read the passage just a little bit further, and he says, I am that powerful one you're looking for. But he says, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Do you realize that out of Luke chapter 13, Jesus prophesied, out of John chapter 18, there was the declaration, I am the one you're looking for. Jesus prophesied about the power of that third day. That day would be a resurrection day. That day would become a restoration day. That day would be a day that would release revival into the world. That day would be a reawakening, and it would be a rebirth of opportunity for mankind. Jesus never allowed the rebuke of someone to prevent you or me from ever experiencing the blessing of the third day. Had he responded to the reprimand, the third day would never have taken place. And if he had responded without conviction, without purpose, without intent of understanding all that was going to happen, what we would have found is this day would never have come. Nothing would stop Jesus from making his way to Jerusalem. No distractions, no threats, no reprimands, and no rebukes. And so here's the reality. Don't you love the final answer? Here's the reality. When I talk about the reality, there's a final passage that I want to read to you. Luke chapter 13 and verse 34 says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I, who's the I we're talking about there? Is it Jesus? How often I, this is, we're seeing the heart of God for just a moment now. And I'm pausing not for emotional effect because I'm trying to maintain my emotions. Because Jesus makes a statement, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. I don't know if you guys see what I see in that verse. But I see the reality of Christ's purpose answered. The reality of Christ's purpose comes hidden in the way that he words his words. He says, I've wanted to gather my kids. The heart of God is to gather his kids. The heart of God is to gather you. The heart of God is to, is to gather each and every single one of us. Some say no. I get it. But can you imagine? He knew the third day was coming. He said, I'm going to finish my purpose. And I'm going to get as many as I can. I'm going to get as many as I can. He wanted to gather his children together. The Bible, the, 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 the final essence of Easter, the answer to this question that I placed in my heart six weeks ago comes in this answer. The essence of Easter through that one day held one reality and one place and one purpose on his mind. You. When was the last time you had an Easter message 
and you're the center of attention. I don't know about you, but that wrecks me. He didn't have to go to the cross. He didn't have to go to the grave. He didn't have to rise again. He could have said, you know what? That lousy bunch, forget them. But the essence, the core, the ethos, the foundation of Easter. I've cried practicing. I've cried writing. I've cried preaching this message. Because when I got it, The essence of Easter is you. The essence of Easter is you. This Easter, there are so many things we could have talked about. We could have talked about the beatings, the hair pulling, the disgusting, vile names they called him. We could have talked about the abandonment of his disciples, the, the trials, the accusations, the lies that were talked about. And we could talk about the, the unpack, the pain of the crucifixion, the piercing of his side or the crown of thorns. We could have talked about the blood. We could have talked about the tomb and the apparent end of him as we knew it. But instead, I'd rather remind you that the essence of Easter was you. He came for you. We get that jacked up sometimes. So in closing, for real, I'd like to reiterate some of the other very important questions that Jesus asked while he was on this earth. And I want you to really reflect for just a moment. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe this year was the worst year of your life and you just as soon write it off. Maybe it was a year of incredible victory, but you know that your tomorrows could be far better. Maybe it's a year of transition. Maybe it's a year of new jobs, old jobs. Maybe it's a, a year of new revelations or dispelled revel, uh, a, a new, uh, new relationships and dispelling or, or the transposing of old relationships. I don't know. I don't know. But the important questions that, that we need answers to at some point, Jesus asked these questions. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Why don't you believe me? He made that statement. Why don't you believe me? He asked the question, would you like to get well? Some of us might not be so well in the room. Why are you afraid? Man, if I give God everything, I know he's going to send me to Africa. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it all in? Often I think of that person, that unnamed someone in the Bible. Because... I like to reflect for myself. Maybe I could have been the one that asked that question. So, so I, I'm going to ask the most important question that you will ever be asked in all of your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to just give you that opportunity because the most important question that you're ever asked in your entire life is what are you going to do with the name of Jesus. Have you been saved? Have you been born again? It's not a question of how many, but it's a question of have you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, and I will not embarrass you at all. I promise. But I'm gonna ask you to assert your heart. And we're going to get out of here in about seven to eight minutes because we've got a final song and a final exhortation. But if you're in this place and you would say to me, Pastor Bob, if something happened to me tonight, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt fully convinced that I would get to partake of the rewards that Jesus was talking about in these passages. In fact, I might be the guy left outside or the gal. Let's be fair. If you're in this place and 
you're not sure, and you say to me, Pastor Bob, I want to receive Christ as my Lord and personal Savior, would you just raise your hand? No, I'm not calling anybody out. There's one. There's two. Anybody else? I'm looking around. Is there anybody else? I'll just give it a moment. Okay, maybe you're in this place and you've accepted Christ once before, but you've walked away. Maybe you've tried to do your own thing and you realize maybe that doesn't work and you just want to rededicate your life to the Lord right now. Would you raise your hand? You just want to rededicate. You say, God, God, forgive me. I want to get right. I just want to be right with you. You're not joining a church. You're not becoming my best friend. There's a hand back there. I've seen three hands so far. Anybody else? There's another hand. You're just saying, God, I just want to recommit my life to you right now. I want to rededicate my life to you. I want to be, I want to know so experience. There's another hand right there. There's another hand. Keep, keep your heads down because, I mean, it's okay. This is between you and God and me. I just, I want to be, I want to know who I'm praying for and praying with. There's another hand right there. I'm just going to take a moment. I'm not trying to, de- I'm not trying to beg, borrow, plead, or steal. There's another hand right there. Thank you so much. All right. Praise the Lord. Put your hands down. I would love for you to do me a favor and just pray this simple prayer with me. All of us in the room are going to do it. And the reason we're going to do it together is we don't, again, want to call anybody out. But there's going to come a day when you're going to have to declare your walk with God because it says, it says in the Word that we're not to be ashamed of our relationship with God because there's a, there's a thing that happens when we no longer declare Him. We become ashamed of God. He'll become ashamed of us. But But I want you to pray this with me. And after service, I would love to shake your hand. I would love to hug your neck. I would love to just affirm you in what God's doing right now. Father, just say this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he came, that he lived a life that was sinless, went to a cross and died, rose again on the third day to fulfill his purpose, which was reaching me. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Become the Lord and Savior of my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think there was six or seven people that raised their hand right there. Church, let's just rejoice with those that raised their hands. At some point, at some point, every one of us are going to have to answer these questions, guys. Every single one of us. Maybe it's not a question of your salvation. You're good there. But maybe it's in other areas of your life. Maybe you don't trust him. Maybe you do doubt him. Maybe you just needed to be reminded this morning you were the essence of Easter. If you needed to be reminded of that, and you're just honest saying, God, Pastor Bob, I needed that. Raise your hand. Just you needed that. You needed to be reminded of that. Praise the Lord. I just want to pray a blessing over you. Pastor Dexter is going to lead us in a final song, and we're going to be gone. Thank you so much for joining us here at Lighthouse Church. If nobody told you today that they love you, let me be the first. I love you, and I mean that genuinely. If you need a church home, we would love to be your church family. We might be a little different than what you're accustomed to. That's cool. I don't want to do church normal anyway. I think think that's boring. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and I pray for the people that you just needed to touch them a little bit today. I'm asking, Heavenly Father, that every single one of us, when we walk out these doors, will have a new grasping and a new understanding of how important we were in the whole equation of Easter. Father, I thank you, Lord, for all that you did. I never want to discount all the pain and the sorrow and the suffering that you endured. But God, I will thank you for the rest of my life for what you did. I pray for the people. Lord, people raised their hands saying, I just needed to be reminded. God, I just ask that you'd bless them, motivate them and encourage them to live this life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Dexter. Let's all stand. Appreciate it. Over all 
things I've done over my distress, over fears I've held. You have spoken over suffering, over past regrets, over sin.
on just a moment of gratitude to our Savior. Just lift your voices. Say hallelujah. Say thank you, Lord. I'm forever yours. Thank you for your blood. You might be a guest today and uh, <clears throat> not really understood just what happened right now. You can go to, uh, back it up in Scripture, go to 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. In the middle of that is sandwiched this chapter of love, chapter 13. But it talks about how the Spirit of God still speaks through the church. And what you heard was a, a manifestation of tongues and also a manifestation of the interpretation. That's a New Testament belief, by the way. It's in the New Testament after Pentecost. felt really urgent to say something that goes along with what was just said. Pastor Bob brought a message that leaves no excuse for not accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I know we had a chance for hands to go up, but I just want to ask you one more time. There's someone else that needs to meet Christ. You won't be honest. You don't go out of this place today without Jesus Christ. Raise your hand. Is there someone else that should have raised their hand? All right. By that, I assume that everyone in here are born again believers of Jesus Christ and the salvation. Let me say to you right now, welcome to the third day. Because there is nothing else that Jesus Christ did not do and was nailed in his body and placed on that cross. Your healing, your blessing, your purpose of life is everything was done on that day. And when he was resurrected on the third day, you are living that purpose right now until Jesus comes. Amen? Everybody say, it is finished. I ought to get a big amen out of that. Come on. <clears throat> because the next message out of the cross in Easter is that Jesus is coming way sooner than you think. Can we give him praise? Amen. To our guests today, thank you for coming and worshiping at Lighthouse Church. I hope it was a great worship experience for you. and. Listen, we want you to come back next week. We're having a guest speaker next week. We have a guest speaker from time to time. He's going to take what the purpose was, was of your life, of being the essence of Easter, and he's going to bring a message on what now are a person that is reaching Jesus Christ in the community. So please come back next week. Everybody come back next week. Okay, now share Jesus with someone also next week. So let's give it up. Now our guests, give it up for our guests today. Come on, yeah. We appreciate the guests.
One last thing that we're going to do is to receive the offering. Uh, normally we do it in the kind of in the middle, but uh, our ushers are standing in the back. And um, so when you go out, just place your offering into or tithe into the uh, buckets in the back. Let, let me just give you a thought. People live a life without Christ and without Christ's blessing. And they just go from time they're born to the time they die. And all the while the cross is there. Now, when I look at this, I see my life. I see the essence of my life. I see the purpose of my life. I see Jesus Christ, my life, in the crosshairs of everything that Jesus provided for me. And let me give you this thought as you get ready to, to give your offering. My, offer, my tithe is right here. This is a part of the essence of my life. And, and the, the scriptures all say that he blesses the work of my hands, and I can testify that. Anybody can testify to that? Okay. All right. Time. You can choose to live in the crosshairs of Christ. Because one day one there and the Bible says that all of our rewards from the treasure of my heart goes to heaven but not only that the blessing of my children in the crosshairs of Christ because first Jesus God had Jesus on the cross and Jesus as the son of God was the apple of his eye now I live in this crosshair, and now I am the apple of Jesus, of God's eye. And his blessing will be upon you. So as you get ready to give, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, upon the people. These, we are your sheep. We are your sheep, Lord, that, that walk through life. We have a life. You, we give, you give us work. And this, this is just the first fruit that we're offering back to you. Lord, everything that comes into our life comes from you. So, Father, we don't, why would we be someone to grasp our money? But, Father, this is the very first fruit of my life, and I choose to bless you. And all of my life, you have blessed me back with health, bless the work of my hands, Lord, you've blessed my children, and now you're blessing my grandchildren, and there's promises in that. I receive that again today. Father, let your blessing be upon your people as they provide for the house of God. Father, I pray peace and joy and long life upon their, their life, their children, and upon their children's children. In Jesus' name. Thank you for coming today. God bless you. Come back next week and tell somebody about Jesus.